They don't use a lot. They don't use a lot of big words, do they? I prefer books with more pictures. Well, this one has pictures. Oh, well, I have to sit on the outside. I get car sick if I sit on the outside. Well, sit, sit, switch for Julie. No, I'm good. <laughs> Does anybody need an agenda? I'm just vain. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I am. I think I printed one. I did. I got some other stuff for you for later in the meeting. Hey. Give everybody some stuff. I guess vanity thy name is, is not always one, one man. Pa no, it's packet? all. Yeah, the whole thing's a packet. Do you have one? You already have all this stuff, Sam? Uh, the uh, whole packet. Yeah, right take there. it out. There's actually some new stuff in there from the, what I sent out in the mail. Oh, I didn't realize you were up there. Hello. New stuff. I didn't realize Yes, you that's what I was saying. That's why I went <laughs> the agenda? You got it. Uh, I'm all fucked up. That's big <laughs> up there. <laughs> nope. Did you need an agenda? Did I give you one? Uh, I think you have one. I don't have these. We're going to be a better than one. Yeah, that's what I figured too. I was like, oh well. Electronics nice, but then it's like, oh, it's hard to look at. Mm. What's that? Well, that was so nice, Sue. Are you getting married yeah. into the sharp? I wasn't even at the meeting, so it was really nice. I was like, oh, what happened? It's like I was getting in the bed. Do you know? Do you know Mike? I knew Mike from Legion. I knew Robbie. Yeah, Mike is my dad's brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who did you put in the bed? Ted. live in the house where they grew you up. You don't want to know how many meetings on the high and on riverfront. Oh, they left you out this time. I'm not sure like that. <laughs> Bruce is up here tonight. Off of Lamprey Street. Oh, yeah. oh, that's down Dame Road and take a right, isn't it? Down Dame Road and take a right, yeah. yeah. Down in there. I thought so. Yeah. My wife grew up on David's uh, away as well. Dame Road. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Who's your wife? Name? Shirley Bonnet. Bonnet. Yeah. Shirley Bonnet. Yeah. Yeah. Shirley Bonnet's her brother. Do people do anything? I think I wave to him every day. Yeah, he and I do not know each other. I've never yeah, spoken to him. But it's years funny, ago, funny. I know. You cross paths with the same cars every day. Years ago, I was walking one day, and I just happened to, so like, I think he maybe swerved to <laughs> give me <laughs> room or whatever, yeah. and I waved to him. And ever since then, we wave to each other yeah. every morning. <laughs> I don't even know. No one Charlie's probably yeah. told to get to the right. I wonder who the hell that is. I know. Yeah. He's got the right pickup, right? Yep. My dad used to there were minutes? Uh, pay all those fields back there, you know, yeah. all that whole, yeah. there's an apartment complex back there on the left before you get to Bonnet Drive. Uh, yeah, the, the Yeah, we can start. Okay, let's start. Oh, okay. Starting. Yep. All right. Uh, welcome to the Thursday, August 11, 2022, New Market Conservation Commission monthly meeting. Um, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, hey, Sue, if you could do the roll call. Sure. Colin White. Yes. Jeff Goldhoff. Present. Ben Jane. Present. Tom Sawyer. Here. Melissa Sharples. Here. We've got David Bell there. I know David and Chris can't make it tonight. I haven't heard from Julie. Cool. And um, since Julie is a full time member, we don't have any alternates, so we actually have. We can have up to three, so just put a word out there in the community that we have opening for alternate members. We'd love to have more people. 
Okay, moving on to approval of the meeting minutes for July 14th, 2022. I was not at the meeting. I did read them. They look good. And thank you, Sue, for zipping them out quickly. I'll uh, make a motion to approve the minutes as written. Second. Second. You got it. All right. Any changes? Discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, so our guest speaker tonight is going to be uh, Barbara Richter, Executive Director of the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commission. She was going to be in, per in person, but she had a conflict, so she's going to zoom in right about 7.30. So we'll just go on with our agenda, and when she, um, she's ready, we'll switch over to her. So I um, have a packet of some information, some of which was in your packet that I mailed. I think, can you pass that around? Um, so one of the things I worked on years ago and I recently updated was uh, a list of town conservation areas that, that we're essentially responsible for and a list of the conservation easements that we are also essentially responsible for. And then there's a few that we hold executory interests where we don't have to do anything, but it's important that we remember that we have those executory interests. So the first... Uh, four pages or five pages. Um, I thought we would just go through those briefly because I really created this as a reference for each of us as members. So the first is the map of the town. And if you look at the map, the whatever color that is to you, orange or rust, those are town-owned conservation lands. So they should look familiar. Wigan Farm, uh, oh, I forgot to label Dearborn, which is right next to Wigan, Tuttle Swamp, uh, Piscastic Loisel, Follett's Brook, we'll talk a little bit about those properties, Heron Point, uh, and then there's a few smaller ones, there's, there's a few around Riverbend, there's Lita Lane properties, which I'm not sure we've ever really um, discussed, there's actually some more there, I just didn't get a chance to highlight those, and then of course we have Sliding Rock and Shanda Park. So we have a lot of land, some of which we've spent more time focusing on than others, and I think that's something we should continue to talk about um, and we look at priorities that we have for our funding that we have. And then the green, the dark green, are the conservation easements that we hold, and most of those should also look familiar. Nostrum Farm, <coughs> uh, Hilton, uh, Bald Hill Reservation, which is a somewhat newer one um, that you, I think you all probably were involved in helping <coughs> provide, I think we provided some funding. That's owned by the Southeast Land Trust. It's up on Hayden Place. And then the Piscassa Greenway area, we hold now the Gaziano easement, and we've held the Schneer and Silverman easements for a while. And then up the north, next to Piscassic Loisel, we have the Smith Sisters easement that we hold. Uh, and then the three executory interests, I think these are the only three, are the Clark Farm, which is a recently conserved property that Southeast Land Trust holds the easement on. Um, Piscassic Greenway Tucker, where we also gave some funding, but we just hold the executory interest and not an easement. And then Richmond, where the, I think the fishing derby is held um, in that area. That's been, the Southeast Land Trust holds the easement on that one. So essentially, Southeast Land Trust holds the easement on all three of those in yellow, and we hold the executory interest. Um, so if you look at the spreadsheets that go with these, um, let's just go across. If we look at the first page, it should be Dearborn at the top. They're alphabetical. So the first two pages are the town held, the lands that we own. Uh, and there's a couple things I want to point out, um, is just, just so you know what's on these sheets. And we can put this up on the town website so anybody can, can learn about these properties. So there's the name of the conservation area. So the top one is Dearborn. The size is roughly 38 acres. It has the date that the town acquired its interest. So in this case, it was a, um, uh, a fee ownership, which is called, you know, we own it. That means fee ownership. Gives the tax and lot number the location, what road and number, and the recorded deeds. So this is what's recorded at the registry, um, the Rockingham uh, County Registry of Deeds. And it says what kind of deed it is, so whether it was a quick, quick claim or a warranty deed, and then if there's a conservation easement associated with it, it would, it would say that. Uh, and then if there's a recorded survey, and then there might be some notes. In this case, this land was donated to the town, and Fishing Game holds a conservation easement, which they monitor 
annually. Um, and so any questions about that information or? I'll say that we did walk one time, a um, long time ago in the middle of winter, we did walk the Lita Lane property. Okay, well let's, yeah, let's, so at some point we should chat about kind those. Of interesting. Yeah, we should <laughs> chat about. in the middle of the swamp, thank you. Yeah, I think that's why we, we have yeah, snow them. <laughs> we snowshoed and, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a good time. That's good. So the next, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this a little bit later when we talk about budget stuff, but if you look on the map and you know where Piscasca Glazelle is and you know where the Smith Sisters is and you know where Falls Brook is, there are uh, two properties right along Falls Brook that the town of Newmarket acquired as part of the what, what they called the waterworks at the time because the town was getting drinking water out of Falls Brook. And so those two parcels were acquired for a dollar or given or some way acquired. Um, and then the, uh, there's a property associated with Carolyn Drive that was that subdivision was called Trotter Park. And that piece is connects to Piscassi Glazelle and the Smith Sisters, so it's that parcel. And that one was actually given to the town as part of that subdivision. Um, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, we haven't really done anything with that property. And there's a, there's a few issues with that. And then north of the Fallsbrook Waterworks properties, there are a few properties, one called Leary and one called Russo. And those were acquired with open space commission funds um, about, uh, let's see what it was, about a decade ago, or a little more than that. Uh, Bart, our town planner, spoke with Sean, our water treatment um, person. <laughs> our water department person, and there the waterworks people are willing for the Conservation Commission to sort of take over responsibility for stewardship of those properties because we no longer get our drinking water from Falls Brook, so they don't really need a res um, to do anything with those. So um, Bart and I chatted about that. So we essentially have, we have Piscasa Glazelle where we have a nice trail, we have a management plan. New Hampshire Audubon has a, you know, they're stewarding that property. And so we have these again, four or five properties that all connect. And I think it might be interesting for us to um, do some natural resource inventory or, and look at a plan for maybe trails or you know what's out there in terms of important resources and wildlife habitat and so forth. So we can um, you know, really take more stewardship responsibility for those properties out there. But we can talk a little bit more about that in, in the budgeting and, and project stuff. So I just wanted to highlight those because that's sort of a new thing. Um, and then let's just jump down to Lita Lane because uh, Jeff, you mentioned it again. So there's the one that I highlighted in orange is one parcel as far as I understood it. And then if you look to the north, sort of northeast, there's a, the road and there's all those lots around it. Those are also owned by the town. They came to the town as part of the tax forfeit, I think, as part of that subdivision. Um, so one, I think we should probably get out there again at some point and look at those. But another thought would be to talk with Bart at some point, and we probably should consolidate those lot lines so it's basically one Lita Lane property. So we get rid of all those little lots, because right now they're listed in the town Tax maps is all different lots, and it's not like it's a tax issue or a funding issue, but it, it's kind of complicated when you're trying to steward a piece of land. So, again, just a that should be a pretty easy thing to do if we think we want to do that. Who who managed? So those are considered other open space. Those are those little lots, not n n who who like manages. The well, that like that's the same thing as the lead, the bigger leader lane is like nobody's really. Yeah, I was wondering about the bigger leader lane thing, it, but that but the bigger leader lane piece looks like it was conveyed. Um, as open space, and the little lots were taken for. Yeah, tax well, money, that's it one of the like things. Is that is so, so would you, how would the I conservation think commission? They are. I yeah, think they're yeah. wet, right? So, so I there think might the be a idea is upland on farm, but they're they're pretty wet. Yeah. Right. So. so I think the idea is we would perhaps make the case that we think that should all be combined into one lot and, and be a conservation area. Yeah. And oh, we so you just talk to the town planner, and then he talks to whoever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think gotcha. you know we yeah. I don't know if it's the town council, or I assume at some point it has to go to the council to, for discussion. Uh, but again, the main point of me doing this is so that we all have the same information and we know, you know what we have in town and, and it's an open to transparent discussion. People can comment and suggest ideas. Then there's three little parcels on Riverbend. Um, 
one of which has a little tiny park. Uh, I don't think anything happens maybe on the other. Well, sorry, there's another little one that I'm not sure anything happens, but there's also a piece, the bigger piece that you see where the Riverbend word is, that's right behind the school parking lot. So I don't think we've ever, and there's a tiny access off of, um, what's the road? I'm not sure it's Riverbend right there. It's, um, actually it shows the access off Packer Stalls Road as well. So there's basically two access points, but. Say that, say that again, where the school? So, so you see where the word Riverbend is? Right. That's where the school parking lot is. The new school parking, essentially the new, where the greenhouses the used to be. That's the school is right there, and then that's the. Um, oh, it's on the other lot. side of the parking lot. Okay. It's on the back side of the, basically the back side yeah, of the parking yeah, yeah. lot. Yeah. So that's a property that I've never been on. Um, it's not very big, but maybe there's a trail that connects to the neighborhood, and then they can walk. In. I don't know. I, yeah. I heard. I recently heard that there's um, a trail to get from the neighborhood over to the school. Yeah, I just heard that this week. I've never walked on that property before, but um, I understand. It sort of that. makes sense, but I think we should, again, that's another one we should sort of visit and whether, yeah, and, and see maybe the neighborhood would like to maintain a trail over there or something like that. So, um, And then we have Shanna Park, which of course we're talking about, Sliding Rock. I don't know if we visit that very often, but again, it's another one we should pay attention to. Tuttle Swamp. Those are those northerly three p where we have a sign and a little bit of a pull off, but no trail because it's also very wet. And of course, we know about Wigan Farm. You know, yeah. I, nev I never realized that the tip of Sliding Rock Peninsula there is actually in Durham. Yeah. Is is does the town of Durham do anything? With is that like conservation? No, land because in it's Durham a, it's or? in w it's in the water, right? So it's it's technically across the town boundary, but it's well, that's what I mean. I asked if, if the town of Durham actually comes up, if it's like conservation land and. Like who owns it? No, we we own it. It's our. It's even though it's in Durham, it's part. Okay, of the, the town doesn't. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah I wasn't sure if it was yeah. split by the town. I think so. Interesting. Yeah. So those are all um, lots of town properties. So we've lots. That's amazing, so. Ellen. Yeah, I think it's Thank helpful. You. I have to see things. I have to see things in front of me. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so let's just quickly go over the what time we got. Yeah, we got time. So the conservation easements. Um, we'll start with, they're also alphabetical. Should be your, I don't know what page it is now, the third page. So, Bald Hill Reservation. So these are a little more, um, not complicated, but we have certain responsibilities when you hold easements. And so we are, we are monitoring some every fall, but there's a couple of things I wanted to raise for our discussion. And again, we can continue it. Um, we are gonna have a conservation easement training in September, so I think we could spend a little bit more time on this then, but just to, to raise the ideas. So Bald Hill Reservation, uh, when that was conveyed to the Southeast Land Trust that now owns that, that conservation area as part of that subdivision, the conservation restrictions were conveyed to the town of Newmarket. So essentially we should monitor that annually like we do other conservation easements. Because if you look at the restrictions, it's, they're written the same way other conservation easements are written. For some reason, I thought when we did that, that they were monitoring it because we gave them a fair amount of money. Southeast Land Trust? For Bald Hill, we gave them like $25,000. Yeah, but you can't, they can't monitor their own easement. Yeah, so if you own a piece of land, you're not supposed to monitor the easement that's on it, which we'll talk about in a second with this gas So um, okay. we should um, add that to our repertoire when we talk about monitoring. It's, it's the one thing is it's small, and it's owned by land trust, so it's pretty easy to monitor typically because we have, they're good partners. Because uh, yeah, I thought the money kind of helped to maintain it in perpetuity, which I, I think we all assumed included monitoring of it. But uh, that's understandable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seriously. Um, hence my, I'll talk about that later, about main us maintaining sufficient funds to be able to do this work, because you can see we have a lot of responsibility. Um, so then the Hilton easement, we actually have farmed that out to Southeast Land Trust for annual monitoring since the beginning because um, I think at the time Wynn was actually on the Conservation Commission, so it was it's kind of awkward for us as citizens to monitor our neighbor's properties when these easements are very complicated and it just can be awkward. So, so I think that's been great that we've been able to contract with Southeast Land Trust for that easement monitoring, and they do a great report um, where they send us a letter every year and, and so forth. 
Um, Smith Sisters Sanctuary, that's owned by New Hampshire Audubon. And we've been monitoring that, I think, pretty regularly. David, I think, has um, been doing that one recently. So that one, again, it's a, uh, it's a um, you know, a conservation organization owns it, and they're a good partner. So that one's relatively easy, I think, to monitor the access. There's no trail. There's no public trail. So I don't think it's a too difficult one to monitor. Uh, Nostrum Farm is off of uh, Doe Farm Road the northwest corner there. We have monitored that one, and I think Patrick was the one who's been doing it in recent years, so since he's not on the commission, we need to think about that one. Um, it's a bit of a complicated one because it's an ag easement, and again, it's a, it's a private ownership. Um, one of my thoughts is that we might want to chat about whether we want to have the Southeast Land Trust monitor a couple more of our easements. And this was one I was thinking about because, again, it's a private ownership. These are our neighbors. Um, it's, it's an ag easement, so it's it's a little more compl complex. And it's got like varying. It's got an exclusionary. Of it's got yeah. It's got lots of different pieces to it. And um, I know we're all capable, but we're also all very busy. And you know we want to do these right. So again, it's just a uh, something for for discussion. We can talk a little bit about it under budget. Um, I have contacted Southeast Land Trust, so they are potentially available to add a couple more if that's something we want to do. Um, Piscassic Greenway Gaziano Tract, as you know, we just did that one and we've accepted the conservation easement. So that one also will be fairly straightforward since it's, a, it's the Southeast Land Trust and it abuts other conservation land, more or less. Uh, and then Schneer and Silverman are right in that same area, so monitoring those is been pretty easy. I've been doing those for a few years. And again, there's so much conservation land around there, it's not too complicated. And the current owner is, um, there's only one owner out there essentially at this time. So, so those are the easements. Um, the next page has lands that we own, but that are also monitored by other entities. Okay, so this is, um, there's three. I think there's only three. There could be some others, but I think there's only three. So Dearborn, when we got the property, it, was, it already had a conservation easement held by Fish and Game, so they've been monitoring that property, so that seems to be going fine. Piscassic Loisel, River Loisel, I know we've been monitoring it, Sam. I think you've been monitoring it. Um, and it's kind of a funny one because Elchip holds the easement, but they want the owner to monitor it which isn't, again, really what you're supposed to do. So we can keep doing it, and Sam, you can weigh in on what you think, but, um, or we could add that one in and see if, we, if we'd like to farm out that one to the Southeast Land Trust. And the only reason I s suggest that one, well, two reasons. One is I don't think we're, you're not supposed to monitor your own properties. Even though we're a town, we still really should be monitoring our own properties because then you're kind of double, um, monitoring and it, it doesn't really make any sense. And we are having some abutter issues there. So so then it starts to get a little bit more complicated. But again, I'm open, completely open. I just wanted to again throw out these ideas. And then we can farm um, the state monitors that one because it was also in a in the L chip program. So does that make sense? Does, the, the, does that all make sense? There was one other one that and then I don't know where it falls on the list that I know CELT used to monitor for the Conservation Commission at, at the corner of Neal Mill and Grant Road, the farm field. Right, but do we have an executory interest in that one? I'm not sure why they always sent us the report then. Uh, maybe we do. I, I can I check this. Because yeah, it's, it's hard to keep track of ones where we have an executory interest. So that we may actually on that one. Yeah, because I'll check. I That's the Dodds. I don't recall, but I, yeah, Dodds exactly. Dodds. I okay. don't recall, but I know that we would get it every year and we would talk about it and we do it. it. I don't. Maybe you haven't received it okay. this year. Okay. I'll talk to the cell. All right. That's good. Because I thought there. That's the thing. It's that's why if we don't have like this kind of system, we won't keep track. Yeah. Of everything, because not everybody sends you the reports if they are monitoring. Okay. Um, yeah. Any thoughts, just generally about that? We'll. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is um, so that you know to keep this 
so that we can keep this sort of thing updated. I think we can put it on our Conservation Commission webpage, and then it will be in like Bart's shop as well. So Bart, as our staff person, can help us keep this information up to date. And we used to do, I, I know I did the Dearborn one with the state twice, blocked it. Right, so yeah. I've contacted, um, OEP or I've contacted, contacted the state to say we want to we want to at least know when you're going out. So some of us, if we're interested, want to go with you because right. if they see anything, we want to know right then what, what right. they found. So hopefully they're going to let us know when they do Dearborn and Wigan. And we did go out with um, Elchip. Elchip monitored the Skassic River Loiselle. Yep. And I think we sent a notice out. So Melissa and I went, and that was a nice yeah, walk on the trail. And um, We were reminded how what things. a lovely property it is. It's so nice it's out there. It's a super yes. amazingly nice property. Found quite a few things. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was cool. Uh, okay. All right, so I'll check on the dot. So great. Thanks for that. Jeff? Neil Mill. Neil Mill. Grant Road. Yep. At the southeast corner. Great. Okay. So, um, so just so one of the things I would suggest if you're able is to, you know, maybe bring this to every meeting because you know it's helpful when we're talking about a property. Everybody will have a map and, and list, and if there's something question arises, we can refer to it. So. And um, if we can get it up on the website, then you, if you bring your laptop or something, it'll be there. Okay. Well, let's keep going until we hear from Barbara. Um, so uh, under land stewardship, we've got Shanda Park. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later with Sam and the advisory committee. But um, we did get the, I think, annual application from Jerry Collins to store uh, what he calls the pocket of Chicks Weir at Shanda Park in the winter time. So he has October 2022 to June 2023. Um, and maybe I'll check with if anybody knows if that's typically what he's requested. I didn't actually look up previous requests. I thought he only left it there to dry. And not to dry store over winter. Yeah, I mean, I haven't known about it in like five years, or three or four years, but mm -hmm. I, I thought he used to not leave it there all the time. And we used to like grant them the right to like, or let them put them out and like he had to put up a sign or something, don't trip on the netting or yeah. whatever. But mm -hmm. I don't remember him leaving it. Um, we could research this some more. He doesn't. He doesn't need to start storing it until October. So we could do a little more research if we felt like it. I know um, on Monday um, I'm going to meet with Bart. Anybody else is welcome. And uh, Rick Malaski to we got a little bit more information about the parking and the accessible, affordable toilet and where various options are there. So I thought on Monday we'd also go around and look at where he typically stores this. Um, I was going to do that with Bart, and since Bart's new to town, he hasn't seen it, and Rick would probably know. So we could hold off uh, on this to see what, yeah, Sue, you have some information? Yeah, I do. Um, he paid for it being on March 10th. He did. Right. Um, and asked for our help in getting in touch with Fish and Game, um, who is the Terry Cavs and the So, so this is the s to store the weir. Yeah. Did he also used to ask permission to use the river? No. Permission. No, because we don't grant permission. That would be a fishing no. game permit, right? Actually, that the river is kind of a way well, for. Right. He, so, he, my my note just said I remember him coming in. Yeah. He, he asked if he said like they're not letting me fish anymore. Right. Can you contact her on and yeah. try to convince her to to let people harvest fish? Right. So I. Remember, I right? Yeah, I actually spoke with Cherie <coughs> Patterson this week because I wanted to ask her, but because you know, because I haven't been you know overseeing this process. So I talked to her this week, and um, the river herring, the smelt has been shut down. For a while. The river herring has been shut down for two years because prior to that, I think it was a three-year average where the where the population was declining, and per the Great Bay Greater Ecosystem Management Plan, which the lamprey is just one piece of, 
um, they have to shut down the fishery for five years. So we can't make a suggestion, nor can Cherie uh, make some change. So we're two years in. This is, I think, the third year. She did say that they are going to, the numbers are coming back up, and I think they're going to raise the issue with the management committee on whether it can be reopened sooner than the five-year. So that's, the, that's him fishing in the, fish, yeah. opening the weir. He can put the weir in the river, but it's whether he can fish. That's an issue with fishing game. No. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's good. Okay. 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 Um, I, I first I don't remember him storing stuff there, and that's a really long time. Into it's a very like long into yeah. The, into the next spring and almost into the summer. Yeah. Where I assume the park will be in use pretty heavily by then. Well, that was my thought. Not having you know, I don't spend a lot of time at that park, but my thought was, um, you know, that's a public park, and I don't know how much this takes up and you know happy to entertain you know more discussion and conversation about this you know is that a space that then is excluded for other people to use the park kind of a thing so and maybe we should just um, why don't we take a little bit more time and bring it back to our meeting next time does that sound like a good thing and mm -hmm. can contact Jerry himself and get a little bit more information about his process does yeah. that sound that good? okay he definitely filled out an application to us for this use like last year too. So it's probably worth at least seeing. Yeah, last just to see. Request. Yeah, <laughs> it for could storage have last year too? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. This, yeah, this is ringing a bell. Yeah, I assume he's probably applied every year. That would be my thought, but it would be good for us to look at what the history has been on that. And I know he, he did. Yeah, he used to dry them and then load them into a truck and drive them off. Mm. Nets. And well, yeah. so that's the nets. This is the pocket. So. Maybe you used I, to leave that. I'm not totally something. familiar with it, but when I talked to Cherie, because I was actually happened to talk to her about it, and she said the pocket is, I think, pretty bulky and, and heavy. So he can take the nets away, but it's the, this pocket. That's what he's asked for, the storage of the pocket. So, I don't yeah. know what that is. <laughs> yeah, well, part of the weir, I guess. So yeah. anyway, let's. we got time. He has. He just asked for October, so let's bring it back, and we'll do a little more research. Um, oh, hi, there, hey, Barbara's with us, okay. This is so cool, so so Tim has put a TV in front of me, so I can I can look that way first, but then when the program is, I'll turn around. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, can everybody hear her? No. Not really. Tim, we can't hear Barbara too well, so I don't know if that's our end or her, but um, welcome, Barbara. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so Barbara is the executive director of the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions, and we've been chatting for quite a while, having you come and talk about our relationship, you know, what is the relationship with towns and, and um, some of your guidance on things you can, you know, guide us on. And um, maybe you can just give a little brief intro of yourself, since I don't have one here. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, but Tim, um, Tim, if you can hear me, we can't hear Barbara very well. Or at all, right? Is it better? Can you hear me? Um, try it a little higher. How about now? Higher? It's getting better. Okay. I think I'm hearing it out of there. Not <laughs> out of here. Can you, uh, can you check this? Is it a surround sound system here? Do we, are you getting me from all corners? That time was better. Keep talking. Okay, why don't you talk okay. about yourself and we'll see how it goes. All right, so I'll try to, sh I can shout, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, I wish I was there in person because then I obviously could just shout that. and make it easier. So um, my name is Barbara Richter and I'm the executive director at the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And prior to that, I have um, worked for a lot of land trusts around the state of New Hampshire. So um, my background is in um, stewardship work for land trusts. I worked with the Monadnock Conservancy doing their stewardship and membership. I was kind of back when uh, land 
Go Barbara, ahead. just hold up for just two seconds. We've lost your uh, sound again. Don't want to miss out. The TV is. Maybe you should set up the TV and we'll just go with this because I yeah, think that's. Yeah. Just hold up a couple more secs. Are you, are you gonna, how about now? <laughs> no. We're doing something on our end, so okay. hold on. You want to say something again, Barbara? Testing. Any luck? No, still can't hear. Hold on. Yeah. Try one more time. Say something, Barbara. She can't hear us. <laughs> okay. I, I can hear something on your end. Yeah. Yeah. No. Not yet? No. No, sorry. So I'll talk to you while we're waiting, just so you I don't know how much you were listening to our meeting, but we just went through um we created a town-wide map of town-held conservation areas and conservation easements and executory interests for sort of our And then we have a spreadsheet of all the properties and when we acquired them and all the recorded documents so that we all have those available to us so we know what our stewardship responsibilities are and that will help us you know, think about every year if there's projects we need to do or what monitoring we have to do. So um, that's just something we were discussing before you joined us. And um, unfortunately, we still can't hear you, so we have to wait. Yeah. I was going to say that's excellent. Whoa. Still no? Hey. Okay, how about now? Anything happening? Oh, yay! Woo! Okay. okay. Well, it's excellent for me to hear that you've done that work because that's kind of the foundation of, of the work that you do is, is knowing what properties you have and what level of protection they're at. And it uh, goes a long way towards, you know, establishing your priorities for the year. So good for you. And it, I can't see the map, but it looks pretty comprehensive. So, um, and, and I was just going, you know, quickly into my background that I have a lot of experience in land conservation, working for smaller land trusts. And then I worked at the Forest Society in their Center for Land Conservation Assistance. Many of you probably remember Digit Taylor. So she and I worked together at the Center for Land Conservation Assistance um, through the Forest Society. And we did a lot of work with uh, local land trusts, getting them um, set up with volunteer monitoring programs. Um, and we did a lot of work with uh, Land Trust Alliance at that time. So, so a lot of my background is in land conservation. But um, interestingly enough, work at NHACC kind of covers a much broader range of natural resource protection. And as you know, it's, um, I think land conservation, it's kind of the most tangible, most exciting part of, of being on a commission. But then there's also, you know, wetland permit review or recommending ordinances or, um, you know, just being involved in the community and educating the public. So there's a lot of other components to the work that you do for um, for your town and your community um, as part of a conservation commission. And of course, that's why NHACC is here because, you know, it's hard to know everything. And um, we are the only organization in the state that serves the needs of the conservation commissions here in New Hampshire. We are a statewide nonprofit. We're not a state agency and we don't receive any um, state funding. So we are, uh, we do, um, are funded primarily by dues and annual meeting sponsorships and grant programs and um, donations from individuals. Um, so 
Of the 234 municipalities in New Hampshire, 217 have conservation commissions and 190 are paying, do, paying members. Um, and that kind of goes up and down a little bit of every year. Um, but we always kind of hover around that number. Um, so we provide technical assistance every day to conservation commissions so that you, know, you can be effective and be successful in protecting your natural resources. Um, you know, with towns ask me questions about everything from warrant articles to what's appropriate spending for the conservation fund, you know, land use change, how to increase land use change tax percent that towns are getting. Um, so it's kind of a wide range, as I mentioned. Um, so in order to really help our, our members, we, we focus a lot on education and outreach. Um, we do have the annual meeting every year, every November. Um, this year it's going to be no November 5th at Pembroke Academy. And so we are gonna be in person this year. So keep my fingers crossed that everything's gonna go okay with that. We are, um, we just updated our handbook. Um, you, hopefully somebody's got a, a handbook out there. Yeah, we got the old, we should talk, we have old ones. Unfortunately, we have a lot of the old ones. So they're uh, 2004. The All right, so we, we do have a new version. Okay. And um, those are easy to get through our office. If you want to um, contact me, they're $20. So we can hook you up with that if you need it. Um, and we've also, um, we have the conservation fund guidebook that's available on our website. We are updating our website. So um, uh, by the end of August, we will have a whole new website section with uh, members resources that are easy, easily available right now. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, you have to log in to get to the members section and that became um, a barrier for some towns and a little more complicated. So we're, we're going to actually offer those members resources without having to log in. And there's gonna be a lot more on our website for our members. So I'm really excited about the new website coming up. We um, got a grant from the Charitable Foundation to pay for that revamp. So it's, it's gonna be exciting. So I'll, there'll be an out announcement at the end of August um, when it's ready for to go live. So just a question, if I question. So sure. we're all members for the New Market Conservation So we won't need, we can, all of us could just go look at the website? Yes, we're, we just made it available. It's kind of be, gonna be like, you know, NHPR that we're just going to, you know, assume that if you're using our website, you can donate you'll then pay your dues. Okay. It'll be an honor system. Because okay. the, the login just, and honestly, the way the website was set up before, I didn't really feel like the members section had a lot of beef, you know, a lot of content to it. It had mm. a few little things, but it really needed, it really needed more content. So mm. I went through the topics that were existing and maybe added a few more and just tried to add more um, resources and links and a little more description of some of the um, issues that commissions face. So it hopefully will be, you know, a lot more information at your fingertips. Uh, another thing we've been working, um, working on is our lunch and learn programs. We've added those. That was one of the kind of benefits of COVID is that we decided to do a lot more online training. And this fall, we've got four programs lined up. We've got, um, Technology and its impact on stewardship. That's going to be September 7th. Learn about LIDAR is September 28th. Agroforestry practices in the Northeast is October 12th. And then working with the media will be October 26th. So again, these are just short kind of introductory programs, but they do offer, you know, as a volunteer, they'll offer a, a good way to connect to other resources or just kind of familiarize our members with some, you know, for your information type things. So we found those to be very successful and, and high attendance on them. Um, we're also presenting a program for DES on source funding for source water protection. And that's going to be September 20th 
um, from 4 to 5.30 p.m. And there's some new DES staff people that will be presenting that program. So um, we try to, you know, work with our partners to get a lot of the information out for them as well. So DES is always a good source of um, funding and obviously the work that commissions do, uh, you rely heavily on DES as well. Um, so let's see, a few other things that we work on every year. We, we always, um, we do have representation on the state level. Um, we work on behalf of our members on the Wetlands Council, the current use board, State Conservation Committee, for Stewardship um, Program, and I'm also on the Taking Action for Wildlife team. So we do a lot of work with other groups and um, kind of connecting and collaborating with our partners. Um, we work closely with the conservation districts, Cooperative Extension, DES, as I said. Um, so it's important, I think, to really have all of that information available to commissions and, and to connect, connect them to the you know, agencies that can help them do their work. Um, we, uh, we've always uh, really worked hard to coordinate roundtables to provide networking opportunities and, and sharing best practices with commissions. Um, the Seacoast Roundtable has been um, very successful, and Jay Deaners, He's actually on our board now, and I really wanted him on the board because I think he's done such a good job with the Seacoast Roundtable, and um, and I think that, you know, I'd like to expand that to other regions around the, sa uh, the state. Um, a lot of other regions have roundtables, but they're not as frequent, and they, they're often not as um, kind of focused and organized as what Jay does. So anyway, can I you, hope. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm not as familiar with other people participated in that. Um, the Seacoast Roundtable? Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit more? I'm not as familiar Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. So um, it meets quarterly, and um, Jay Diener from Hampton organizes it. But um, let me know if you want to make sure, you know, to make sure you're on that email list um, and I'm trying to think you know I would think that new market would be considered seacoast he, he might have a like a, a fairly um, narrow um, definition of well, in 50 years we will be the seacoast so we're seacoast. <laughs> absolutely right <laughs> they'll be underwater over there so we'll be <laughs> right and, and I think you're facing the same you know concerns and issues um, so I can kind of check in with him and see if, if we yeah. can expand the membership to include new market. But, um, you know, that, that's exactly it. A lot of topics focus on uh, stormwater management mm -hmm. and sea level rise and groundwater mm -hmm. issues, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, keeping track of your conservation land. He's, he's got some really great um, topics that they've discussed over the years. And I, I always attend because I like to learn what other commissions are dealing with and, and have concerns about and what their focus is. So um, so that's so just an informal, group. like anybody could form a round table or you provide Absolutely, support? Absolutely, yes. Like yeah. Okay. So, so let me check with Jay and see where, you know, what his region is. I should know it, but... Um, I don't know how far in, in inland it goes, but if it's not, you know, we can always create a, a round table of, um, you know, three or four or six or, or whatever you think would make sense to connect the commissions in your area and talk about a topic. Um, sometimes there's speakers. Um, sometimes it's just all the commissions bringing up a specific uh, topic of concern or just maybe talking about some success they've had in recent, you know, whether it's outreach and education or, um, you know, dealing with a permit review issue and how they all, how, how they all deal with specific. Um, We've had some brief conversations about maybe, you know, collaborating with like Durham on trail networking or Lee or yes. culverts or so, so I, it seems to me Hamptons is, you know, joking aside, it's a little bit farther away, I think from our, 
scope over here. And so it seems like it would make more sense to have a different um, small, you know, because you if you get too big, then the issue yep. becomes a little bit unwieldy. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe something we think about. Absolutely. And I, I really think they're great um, for everybody. And, um, and I, I mean, I'd be happy to help um, get them going for you or, um, you know, run them or however, you know, whatever makes sense to you. Um, we can definitely work on that and, and connect and make sure you're, you know, talking with others in your, in your area. So you can, again, network and collaborate. Um, so let me just run, run through a few uh, projects that we're working on this year. Um, as I mentioned, that website's been updated and um, we'll have a, have a new member section, so that's going to be exciting. Um, we are working on a wetland permit training program with DES and certified wetland scientists. We've always offered uh, training, um, wetland permit review training at the conference. And some of them have been like a two-part session, but it's always, it's hard, you know, there's a lot to know. Mm -hmm. So I sat down with um, Marianne Tilton from DES, Sandy Crystal, who's retired from DES, and um, Rick Vanderpoel is a certified wetland scientist. And we kind of talked about a full curriculum and how to really address, you know, everything from how to identify a wetland to what are some relevant comments you'd want to include in your, your permitting. Um, and we came up with, it'll probably be a six session training program, uh, a little bit of a hybrid. Many of that will, many of those six or, or I think we'll maybe do four of the six will be online and then we'll do two in the field, something like that. We're still um, working on the, the specifics and the details, and we hope to have that ready by the spring of 2023. So who's, the, that, who's the audience for that again, for that training? That it, conservation Commission members, uh, you know, especially anyone who's a new Conservation Commission member who is not familiar with the wetland permit review process. Mm -hmm. You know what would be also helpful, um, in my opinion, having, you know, worked on this, doing some of this work, and others here have as well, is it's still a little confusing. Like we're a conservation commission. We need to put in a new footbridge. We need to put in a little boardwalk across a wet site on a, on a trail. Mm -hmm. And you know, what permit do we need to hire someone or can we do the permit ourselves? Is it, yep. is it, it's never very, even I've done it and I'm still yep. confused about the process. Yep. So even just a one session training for those cons for conservation commissions that want to, the need to get a permit for, typically a relatively simple yep. trail cross, you know, trail crossing. So that would, I think would be really helpful because I can think of several that we need to potentially do in Newmarket. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So basically how, how can commissions get a, a permit, permit for work on the town, on right. town land basically. Yeah. And it used to be yeah. sort of straightforward. Yep. And then I thought they changed to make it more straightforward, but it seems like it's more complicated. It, it, exactly. I know they tried to make it easier, but yet it's still, yeah. kind of uh, complicated. Yeah. So that's a great um, topic. And that I think would also be just a great, um, might even be a good lunch and learn program or yeah. a or workshop at mm -hmm. the conference. Um, our conference is pretty much uh, filled up already for workshops, but maybe a spring lunch and learn or we're, we haven't decided, I think, um, this more intensive wetland training will probably be um, a whole, you know, you sign up for all of them, but maybe some of them will be recorded that will then be shared. But if we address that specific topic within, yeah, within one know, of the sessions. program, we could have it, make it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's a really good uh, suggestion. And I, I wrote it down and, and I know, I know it's not as easy as it should be. Um, oh, it's really windy out now. Um, so we also work on the legislation. Um, every year we track uh, dozens of bills this year we tracked and we provide testimony. We went to um, either written or verbal testimony at, at 10 public hearings. Um, 
and I can give you some highlights from this year's session. Um, there were a lot of right to know laws, uh, bills that offered um, the opportunity to have online meetings. Um, a lot of towns felt like they still wanted the opportunity to meet online and uh, or, or the other bill that was um, Im would impact conservation commissions would have removed the requirement for the in-person quorum so that you could still have a location but not everybody on the commission would have to be in person. So anyway, the um, we did support the um, right to know laws, these bills that would have made it possible to hold the meetings remotely um, in order to give conservation commissions more options for meetings. Um, unfortunately, those bills did not pass. One was killed and the other, one, other ones were laid on the table. So as you know, you're still meeting in person. Um, they may, might not be as important anymore, but uh, we did support them. Um, and we felt that most of our members wanted to have more options when it came to um, meeting remotely. Another bill that was kind of a interesting one to follow was the, um, the law, um, House Bill 307, which allowed guns on town land. And it would have really um, severely impacted a mun municipality's ability to regulate guns in any way, even on town land. Um, and we felt that this could be a safety issue with the you know, variety of uses of, of many of our conservation lands. So we did um, oppose this bill and we sent a letter to the governor and to um, both the House and Senate leaders and um, the committee that it was in. Um, and it, we just really felt this strongly that this would have prevented municipalities from managing their own land in a way that was appropriate for multiple interests and you know that would be safe for the citizens of their community. So the good news is that that was in a committee of conference and they, they never came to an agreement so the bill was basically killed. So that was good. Um, a couple more um, interesting bills that we were happy to support were the uh, cyanobacteria study bill and that um, requires DES to create a cyanobacteria advisory committee and this will you know study the causes of cyanobacteria and hopefully um, come up with some ways to prevent cyanobacteria so that's a, a good win for um, water quality in New Hampshire and so we did support that one and we did um, testify at those those hearings. Um, the Upland Invasive Species Program is another um, important piece of legislation that was passed. Um, and this is a bill that created a um, Upland Invasive Species Program through the Department of Agriculture, Mar Markets, and Food. And what's great about this is that it's going to help track the spread of invasives and help notify towns of infestations in the area. So hopefully it will um, be a way of early detection and prevention of, of um, and pre preventing the spread of some of the invasive species. And I believe there's also a, there, there's a pool of money available for use of herbicides as well. So it's all within the Department of Ag and um, Doug Saigon from Department of Ag, he's going to be presenting at this year's um, NHACC conference um, to talk a little bit about the new program and how that's going to be, um, how they're going to run that. Um, I think it doesn't technically start until next calendar year. So he'll have the details on that at, the, at our November 5th conference. Um, we've always, any legislation that comes up to protect water quality or wetlands, um, we're almost always going to be involved and support um, any of that legislation. There's been a bill um, for the past few years um, to change the definition of prime wetlands. And that would be, um, the new definition would include those narrow portions of a wetland, those kind of fingers and toes that are important to um, primary wetland functions. So um, 
We've supported that for the last couple of years, but again, the bill was tabled that that's just, we can't seem to get that one through. Um, so we'll keep working. We've worked closely with Rick Vander, Vanderpoel on that one. He, he's um, been working hard to protect our prime wetlands. Question, question um, about, can I ask you a, a question about prime wetlands? We've talked, sure. we had our prime wetlands map by Mark West, mm -hmm. I'm not remembering the year, it was 2009 or something. Yeah. And um, then we had them digitized. I think that's what the Regional Planning Commission did for us. But Mark suggested that they're they're kind of out of date. The the process he used was sort of an old the old style of how they were assessed. And he feels like there could be some wetlands that are no longer prime, and then we may be missing parts of wetlands that are that are prime. So to be fair to landowners and and also to protect the the wetlands, he thought we should update our prime wetlands mapping. Can you, uh, you just mentioned a law that you're trying to update, but do you think it is, we should update our prime wetlands maps? What's your thoughts on that? Not knowing, I guess, what they look like or anything, but. Yeah. Well, I know that some towns were kind of waiting to see if this law would be passed before they designate prime wetlands. I, you know, I, I don't think you can kind of hold your breath in a sense on, on the, the legislative sessions and, and what's going to happen. Um, and I think if, if Mark West has recommended that, I think it's probably a good thing to look into. Um, and maybe there's, you know, a simple way to do it. Um, and if, you, you know, if he has a way that you can use more um, online mapping or um, yeah, it's still not, it's not super, I mean, it's, you know, it yeah. could be five to $10,000. I don't know, you know, exactly how much, but I didn't know if there are, if there are any funding sources that help with prime wetlands mapping that you know about. That's a good question, and there really should be, and I'll think about it, um, but off the top of my head, I don't know of, um, gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll see if, um, that would be great. Yeah, if you could, if you know of anything. Yeah. We have lots of project priorities, so. Yeah, I know, Any, I know, um, and I would love support. to see more grants available for even, you know, updating your NRI. That, that kind of work can get very expensive these days, so um, tapping into some additional funding sources is great. So let me see if I can find anything that looks like it might be a good match for, for doing wetland inventory or wetland. Great, wetland. that would be great, thank you. Okay. Um, and then just I would say uh, there was another um, OHRV uh, um, high, off highway recreational vehicle study that's out and um, NHACC was asked to submit a nomination for a commission member. Um, again, as a representative of Conservation Commission, so we um, we're able to fill that seat with uh, Suzanne Smith, who she is a state rep, but she's not returning, um, or she's not running for re-election, so she'll be technically a regular person. Um, but she does have a lot of good experience with OHRB and um, and its impact on, especially on conservation land. So. Um, so that's kind of a quick roundup of what I've been working on and what we do for commissions. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you and what your needs are and how we can help you. Um, it, you know, I'm, I've been very impressed with all the work that New Market does and uh, the uh, special event that you have in the fall looks really great. Um, are you, are you planning to do that again this year? We are, yep, yep, October, October 15th. We have it all okay. scheduled. And um, we also do, um, these have been really successful, just what you're doing tonight is we have these, you know, just presentations on different topics, and uh, we, we glean a lot of great information. So yep. we're very now, do you do that every meeting? Or? Almost every meeting, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's nice because even though the meeting has to be in person, the speaker can be Zoomed in, like you. Yeah. So well, thank saves, you for letting me do this. I, yeah. I ended up kind of getting double booked, so I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. No, I mean, in person's like nice, it. but in some ways, you know, you don't have to drive. You're not using, you know, energy, yeah. and, you know, we're conservation, right? So it's yeah. nice to uh, save those resources. Yes, that's um, very true. Yeah. 
Um, no, the other sort of, I guess we, we have some other cool stuff um, related to the riverfront, which we'll talk about in, coming up in our agenda. But we um, have a new town planner, relatively new, Bart McDonough. I don't know if you've met him, but he uh, started just this year. Is that right? Or, yeah. And um, the great news, this is the first time that our, the town and our town manager uh, assigned Bart as a staff person to the Conservation Commission. Oh, good. So this good. is the first time we've actually had a staff person um, oh. help us, which is huge. That's enormous. That's going to yeah, be really that, helpful. That is huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's so wonderful. We're very, yeah, we're very happy. And he's got lots of creative ideas and has been helping out already a lot. Okay. Awesome. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or things they want to share with? What's the date of the um, annual meeting again, just so we get that in our notes? It's uh, November 5th, November Saturday, 5th. November 5th, and it's going to be at Pembroke Academy. Okay. And it's 8.30 to 3.30. Great. All right. All right, and um, yeah, I definitely want to uh, circle back and talk a little bit more about the roundtables with you as well, so. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we can explore whether there's other towns. I know. Um, that would be helpful. I think that would be helpful. I know Lee uh, had emailed me a while back about culvert inventories because that's kind of a okay. regional thing, and I haven't really heard. I thought they were doing it in this region, but you know, there are topics that apply to all of us. That, like you said, it would yeah. be helpful to have multiple towns talking about them, so we're not reinventing the wheel. Absolutely, yeah. Watershed issues and, and culvert inventories are really yeah. a, a good good topic for regional or at least cross town boundaries. Yeah. So. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Any anything else that you um, would need like help with or and you wanna or, highlight or Yeah, I think we covered a lot of territory, so appreciate yeah. your input. We did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for joining us and um Oh you're it. so welcome. Yeah, you're welcome to stay, but you probably have other things to do. So feel free to stay in or leave. I think it'll just automatically, <laughs> we'll continue on. Oh. So thank you, Barbara. Right. Thank you. Well, I think I am going to get yeah. going. I, I was had back-to-back -back meetings yeah. tonight, so ready to, to just chill out for a sure. little bit. But, um, Completely understand. <laughs> yes, yeah. but a, a thank you all for the good work that you do. And again, I love hearing about what everything that's going on in New Market. So. So we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. This is really good. Really good, uh, helpful stuff. Um, okay. So let's uh, circle back to our agenda under land stewardship. There was a couple more property related things before we. Um, I think we're going to rearrange the budget thing discussion, but. Um, so Shanda Park Accessibility, I mentioned that a meeting with Bart and uh, Rick Molaski on Monday to talk about this accessibility because we had this portable toilet issue in terms of accessibility that didn't quite work because of the timing this year, but in terms of location and, and those sorts of things. So we'll, we'll discuss that on Monday. Anybody's welcome to join us. I think we're meeting at 10 at Shanda Park. Um, a couple of things related to Piscassic River Loisel. Um, as I mentioned, when we were out there doing the easement monitoring, um, we do have some butter issues with trails and some tree cutting, which may or may not have been fully recent, but it is on Piscassic Loiselle. So at some point, we're going to have to talk to the neighbor. But it's also, um, so Bart and Melissa and I actually went out there, and we were actually looking at the Carolyn Drive property because that is also town owned, but nobody was really, we haven't been stewarding it, so there's some issues, similar issues with that property. And that's why um, Bart, we've talked with Bart, and he suggested we should, you know, take a look at all those town-owned parcels and, and maybe do a, like a natural resource inventory and assess the boundaries. And so it's hard to say somebody did something when we haven't, you know, we don't really have a full assessment of the properties out there. So. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more under budgeting about how we might go about doing that, if we think that's a good idea. So. The only time I remember looking at the Carolyn Drive property was when a large tree fell down and the neighbor had us remove it. Right. Like yeah, we've property. had, yeah, we've done other things. So, yeah, so there's stuff like that. So you don't know if the tree was taken down for that reason or if it's because we're not, we just need to pay a little bit more attention to the properties out there. So just wanted to bring that up. Um, 
field mowing. I didn't know, Melissa, if you had any updates. And we do know the we were out there actually. I think just after he had mowed the yeah, field. Yeah, he did mow it. Um, third week I of July out, or something. Um, he's kind of been playing phone tag, so yeah. I'm hoping to you know catch up with him. He has a local farm in Lee, and um, you know it's just good to make contact with him and find out about his schedule, whether or not he is planning on doing it again in the fall. And yeah. we'd like to get him to sort of delay a bit, um, maybe into mid to late October. Yeah, I know it used to be, um, and we've had this property for a while, so it used to be the recommendation was as long as you waited till after mid-July to mow a field, then the birds would have finished nesting and the deer would have finished with their fawns. But we now know that, you know, we want all the pollinator habitat, right, yeah. for the fall. So right. that's, yeah. Yeah. that's part of it. So that would be great to touch base with him and um, see. Um, the other thing we talked about, Melissa, I'll let you talk about this, is potentially a new roadside sign. Yes. So, um, Jeff, I do need to get up with you. Uh, we want to basically kind of make the signage throughout all the properties in town consistent. Um, love the look and feel of the Heron Point sign and um, Shopmire. Um, and right now the signage at Piscassic Loisel is – First of all, parallel to the road, so you can't see it, mm -hmm. and it's stuck in a bush that's been overgrown. So, I, you know, I, um, I met with Rick about, um, you know, how we should approach it, and he basically said that because it's right on the on the road, that uh, it's a state issue. So I reached out to Fish and Game DOT DOT. Um, they pushed me over to traffic, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to get in touch with uh, somebody within the traffic department uh, just to sort of get a first step. Yeah. Because you feel like it's within the, the right of way. It's in the road right away. It's right yeah. in the, yeah, it would be in the road. And, you know, the, the current sign is on the right-hand side of the driveway as you pull in. Um, you know, Rick and I discussed we think the best place for it is on the left-hand side of that, perpendicular to the road. Um, kind of in front of that stone wall there, um, and you know. I believe that Connor, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if I'm going to be correct, but that that access, the beginning of it, is an easement. Right. So the yeah. question. So you may need permission from the landowner to put it wherever. Yeah. Yeah. We'll and that's we're really why. Yeah, yeah. We were, you know, involving Rick and trying to figure that out. But he, Ooh. his so suggestion was the state. Yeah, you surveyed it. So the question is. So if it's in the DOT right away, does the landowner have any ownership, or is it is always the DT, DOT or the state owns it, right? So we think it's in the DOT right away, but they'd have to tell us. They have control over the right of way, whether or not they own it or give it special. Yeah. Ways, but they do have control yeah. over yeah. the signage, and I'm not an expert yeah. on what types of signs. But we definitely and talk. And even if they don't, yeah. you know, I mean, we would certainly want to be respectful yeah. of the homeowner, you yeah. know? and see if they thought it was okay. Because it's in front of their property. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It would be and in front I, of their property. Yeah. I'd be upset about that. I, I, I yeah. don't think at Shopmeyer, if it was like in the stone wall, maybe or right in front of it. If I remember, I can't remember, but yeah. I don't remember any discussion of even approaching DOT about that one. I'm not yeah. saying that we shouldn't. I'm just saying I don't recall yeah. any, any discussion about that. Yeah, I don't. I think they're particular about signs along roads. So, but um, so it, it's just it's really tight on the right side. So it's not like there's even really. Like the snow plow might hit it yeah. if you try to put it on the right side. It, it could be too that I mean, Shopmeyer, that all that whole property is is Op kind of open and, and owned by and maintained by the same organization, right? The church. It, yeah. It's not like we're uh, the sign there is on s encroaching on someone else's property or yeah. something like that. No, so no, no, that's no, where. I was yeah. about the right of the road. Yeah. I can look at our plan to see where that right of way limit truly is there. Um, yeah. Yeah, might not, the sign might be back 10 feet yeah. from them, but. And, yeah. but um, I think Ellen mentioned you're the one with the contact for signage. Did you have a company yeah. that you worked with? For those, if I, I, I think it's Kindle, I believe it's Kindleheim, and it's, it is in um, Rye, and it's just north of, if you look for it, I think it's Kindleheim, if I'm not okay. So they would have right. the design in their shop. Yeah, right? I actually probably have the emails yeah. and stuff. Yeah, great. So that's yeah, if you could dig that up and send it to Melissa, that would yeah. awesome. be great. Um, and then w if we decide to go for that at some point, we could get a quote and then get uh, approval. And not 
over the fence is where the other one is. Yeah. And then the other is by the door. Yeah, they're great looking. Yeah, they yeah. look really yeah. nice, too. They're really nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Looks nice. Uh, okay, great. Thank you for working yeah. on that, Melissa. Um, so October 15th is our Conservation Connections event, and last year we did a volunteer work day at Heron Point. So we talked about maybe uh, doing one at Kaskaski Loisel, and a couple ideas we had were cleaning out the bird houses, which is kind of a nice thing to do with volunteers. Um, the bridge. The bridge. So the footbridge. If you haven't been out there in a while, the footbridge is about ready to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, those so um, ready to go. it would be a pretty easy bridge to rebuild, and it would be bank to bank, so we don't need a permit. Um, that's kind of why I raised that, but I knew we don't need a permit for that one. So we would just need to, you know, design a pressure treated um, simple bridge. I've done a bunch for Durham, so we could sure come up with a design. Yeah. But just wanted to see if you thought. And then we talked about maybe putting some signposts, some four by four signposts. It's got a couple of junctions. Um, particularly maybe that first junction and then at the far end because that's where it starts to get a little confusing on where yeah. people are. And then we would make, um, we already have a trail sign, but we could print, you know, again those sales and put them on the post. So, but the volunteers could install the post. You know, that's kind of the good stuff. You are here today. You are here, yeah, yeah. exactly. You're here. And yeah. The, and the, the trail junction is the, the link over the Yeah, the exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, do you think that's a good idea to have a volunteer work day on that day? And a couple of us could plan to be around and, and help with that. So maybe we'll try to, s I can try to spec out the trail bridge cost and prove some funding. Huh? How big is the bridge? Not very. It would probably be um, three feet wide by 12 feet long at most, maybe 10 feet. The, that current one is about yeah. three feet. Yeah, so feet just to make sure you get there. It's, it's just a little brook. I drove those logs out there. Ah. Oh, and did they were you? cut by Cy, the fellow that lives on oh, really? North Main Street. Yeah. And yeah, he oh. put them in the back and he drove them out of the, I drove them out of the truck off the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like his native wood, but they don't, <laughs> I suppose they don't last. They don't get much pressure treated. So, yeah, so probably roughly three feet by 10 feet or something. We talked too about maybe connecting a little bit more of that Carolyn Drive ish property in with the trails that are there. Um, yeah. And I whether that's something to do on, in, you know, on the volunteer day or? I think we're probably else. a little soon because I think we need to um, maybe do this bigger visioning for that all that area out there since, since um, you know, we really need to work with the neighborhood out there so they're not totally surprised oh, yeah, by anything new. So I think we probably don't have enough time to get all that in place um, by October, but, you know, maybe next year that would yeah, be a yeah. good project for next year. Um, so, okay, yeah, so we'll keep working on that. Um, we can farm. We the uh, Rockingham County Conservation District did go out there in July to do some invasive treatment. I haven't heard any follow up yet, so I just wanted to report on that. And the town is still doing a great job mowing the trails uh, through the field. So that's great. I had a, a question asked of me about the invasive re uh, herbicide on that urban farm. Mm. Was that like targeted, painted, or was it sprayed it by? It's a uh, they spray. Uh, very uh, very low level, low um, concentration of herbicide. So it's mostly surfactant. It's mostly, um, I think they use, I don't know if they're using water or oil. It depends on what they're using for the herbicide. Asked, but I was asked why, we're why, <laughs> why we, were, we were taking the herbicide and not taking the sumac. <laughs> oh, we're not taking out the sumac, they must actually. Have just got hit. Yeah, it, 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 it could have been. It's, it's really, really thick in there. And so there's going to be a little bit of um, there's going to be a little bit of overspray. Okay. Yeah, I met with them out there in July and, and talked about that. But it's really hard. It's just it's what my my philosophy on that is. We want to get to a point where we've we've knocked it back, so the natives are above the invasives. And right now the invasives are totally above the natives. So we have no way to um, stop the invasives from completely taking over that site again. Particularly the bittersweet. It's really um, very difficult, so yeah. Invasives are not an easy uh, stewardship <laughs> issue, so. But it's good. It's good for people to ask and keep an eye out. It's good that people are, are taking a look. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on to finances.
So I gave you, I think I sent the packet, and then I think I might have given you a few things tonight too. Uh, so let me do the finance report. So we ended the fiscal year for you know, our general fund June 30th and started a new fiscal year July 1st. So if you flip to the general fund budget, I think I gave you two pages, sorry, two pages tonight. And um, the good news is that I didn't quite realize this, but you know when we do the budget, so we're, we're, we're gonna be recommending a new budget to the general fund that the budget committee and so forth will look at this fall, but that's not for until FY24. So you know we're always way ahead. So when this budget started July 1st, I thought we were still under the 2900 um, budget, but Steve had increased our budget apparently last year in the budget, or whoever did increased our budget because we didn't do it at the Conservation Commission. So remember our total was $2,900 in the general fund. Well, this fiscal year starting July 1st, it's now $4,185. And the big jump was they put more money into the, the uh, part-time salary. That's for you, Sue. <laughs> um, so that was really nice. And then the only other change, um, let's see. Um, I don't have, I didn't actually include last year. So I think it was um, under dues, we actually had 400 and it was dropped to 350, I'm not sure why. Um, and then really the, only, the increase was in the part-time salary. So if you look down below, um, We've we've you know started expending out of this new budget, which is which is which is fine. Um, so I talked to Bart about because we still need to now submit our budget proposal for FY24 for the general fund, and since it's at 41.85, that well that's pretty good. But if you look under the dues subscriptions, it did get dropped to 350, and we pay NHACC $500. So Bart and I discussed. Um, that we should request another $150. So our request would go from, instead of 4185, which is this fiscal year, we would request $4,335 to reflect that extra 150 for the dues. So if that um, makes sense, maybe we would, um, or we have a discussion, or you can take a vote to recommend that then I would write a memo to um, Steve and copy Bart as our proposal for our, our budget for next fiscal year. But happy to have a discussion about what you think if we want to ask for more. Or, um, the, um, so, so one other point. So under contracted, we have $300, which is what we've had, and that pays for the Southeast Land Trust to monitor the Hilton easement. I think it's helpful to have that money in contracted, but as I discussed earlier, I think I think it might be helpful to think about whether we want to have CELT monitor some other easements, mm -hmm. and it might be three hundred dollars a piece. Then, so that'd be let's say it's nine hundred dollars. Let's say it's a thousand dollars, because it's monitoring conservation easements. I really do think that that could come out of the conservation fund because that that's like an essential thing that you do with conservation fund money, but it would be helpful to keep that 300 and contracted because we might hire someone to do wetlands mapping or have Stratford Regional do some contract work for mapping or something like that. So I don't think it should go away even if we switched yeah. paying for the easement monitoring because I think we might find some important uses for hiring contractors. Does that make sense to, to people? So that we had always leaned on that contracted portion of the budget. They did. So to not use conservation fund funds <laughs> to pay for contracted service and like that. Mm. So the money would, I think the feeling, and I thought the understanding was the money would be better spent for education and land conservation and actual things that need to be done to the property, mm. not just the bookkeeping or, or monitoring. But yeah, I mean, that's, it's a valid, I just don't know if, I don't think we'd get another, if we want to hire CELT to do a few more, I mean, we may not, you guys, you know, whatever you, the group consensus is, but we're not going to get another 900 or 1,000 from the general fund to do that, I don't think. We could ask, but. Or split the difference, ask for like 600. And yeah. Pay a little bit out of that. Yeah. But I do understand your, your point yeah. of not wanting to just kind of trickle out of the 
Yeah, I mean, we do have a lot of other stewardship responsibilities. So, um, I mean, I'd be happy to say we could we could say this is easier. We're thinking that we need. I mean, I guess let's let's back up a step on that piece. How much did they expend last year on on contract on two ninety nine? <laughs> no, on um for what? Uh, like part time, part time students. Oh, so we um we spent twenty nine. We spent um about thirty one hundred dollars. That's at 3335. Oh, okay, 3335. We went over last year, but that we were only at uh, we were only at 2000, right? Yeah. Yeah. So only raised yeah, yeah. Just Sorry. Just so we, yeah, we weren't we didn't go over. We went over like 22. So we're pretty high. You getting another raise? All right. Okay. So I thought you had said 4 or something like that. So what I was thinking. The total was 4185. Well, let's uh, do a quick um, do a quick thing on that because we know what you what you but what you spent there. So we'll do a quick. Um, it's it's interesting. <laughs> That's a minute fraction of the town's budget. <laughs> you would think. So you uh, you budget twice twi you Maybe. twice twice a month, um, or it just happened that they build twice a month here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if we extra, if we let's say you did that every month, that amount probably wouldn't be that much, but that comes out for twelve months, thirty-five hundred dollars. So it would be a little more than. Does it matter? I don't know. I'm not um, really a full-time commission member at the moment, so I don't keep an eye on it. But I do know, you know, Bart did mention, you know, seeing if we could get the um, the uh, the the hundred percent or. Of the change of use yeah. tax and, you know. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Actually, I didn't put that on my list, but so we currently get 50% of the land use change tax. So when someone takes their property out of current use, um, and I'll be happy to report if we got some money, uh, we get 50%, and the 50% goes into, I think, the general fund. So a lot of towns, and I don't know out of the 191, different. some towns get nothing, some get 25%, some get 50%, and a bunch get 100%. So we could advocate that the conservation get 100% of the land use change tax instead of 50%. Yeah. Would we like to do that? It, it, it's just a funding thing that I was thinking. I mean, the, and the money from mm -hmm. the conservation fund, the big dollars that come out of there go to protect the land. Right. So you, you're directly using large right. amounts of that, like mm -hmm. per gallon, and then ball bill. Yeah. The reason that I was in, I, I remember in Clark Farm, I think the town did a bunch mm -hmm. of work to this land. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's what I always felt the core reason for the conservation fund was, you know, and then the town gets it, and now that the town has it, it's only benefiting the town constantly. Yeah. So the town should be able to just spend it on the public credit fund. Mm -hmm. You know, right. we a thousand dollars is a lot of money a year to monitor three properties that the town has invested. Yeah, at least right. tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like protecting our asset. Okay, so why don't we um. Why don't we request a thousand under contracted? Well, do you do you, do you like the idea of potentially approaching Delt to monitor a couple more easements? What do you think? I do. Yeah, it's probably worthwhile, especially under the reasoning you gave of maybe not wanting to monitor our own properties as well. Yeah, I think Piscataway Zell we should, and the Nostrum um, we could keep, but then somebody's got to monitor it, so one of us has to step up, and I know we're all pretty busy so uh, that would be my thought on that one and again it's it's the ones that are more complicated and they're they excel at it like they're that's a that's their expertise to monitor easement so um, let's let's uh, I don't think we could request the funds in our general fund budget request unless we think we're going to do it because then we don't have a reason to ask for that extra money I agree. The, the only, I, I think that it's it's money well spent. It should be done. I do, I do think it wouldn't be a bad idea for one member to accompany someone, mm -hmm. just to make sure someone from the commission has seen the property yeah. mm -hmm. in the last twelve months. Yeah, I agree. But I, but the preparation of the report and mm -hmm. I mean they're professionals. Yeah. Like I, I I put a lot together. So I do a service on that. I know things would come up on. Dodd, we agreed the mm -hmm. Dodd report, but there's like, uh, mm -hmm. did we do any of that? Mm -hmm. Did we have 
it's still in person, yeah. you know. You can make another trip out there now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's let's do that. Let's um, because we have these these two data points for July for part time salary, and if you extrapolate out twelve, it comes to thirty five hundred dollars. So I think we should just bump that up from thirty three thirty five to thirty five hundred as a request. You see how I figured that out? <laughs> if we take the two um, invoices from Sue for July, you add those together and you multiply it by 12 months, you get around $3,500. Some months are going to be more, some are less, but stand-up job by our part-time salary recording secretary. So, uh, What do you think about that? And then general supplies. I mean, if we wanted to give back, although we don't really, I don't know if that would go that under here. So if we tally that up, uh, so we say 3,500. Yeah, I'm probably so sick I should lose my head. <laughs> So 4,200? No, wait, it's got to be more than that. I'm going to do it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we only went up. Uh, yeah, so I guess it would be uh, 4,200 request up from. No, that's not right. Sorry, what, what were you trying to calculate? I was trying to see what we want to request. So if we current the current FY23 budget for part-time salary is 3335 and we're thinking of bumping that up to 3500. Right? So that's um, 165 additional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Current contracted is 300 and we're thinking of going to 1000 to cover additional contracting for easement monitoring. Right. So that's 700. Uh, the dues for NHACC are five hundred dollars, so the dues would go from three fifty to five hundred. So that's another one fifty, and we would drop supplies from two hundred down to one hundred. So we minus a hundred. That makes sense. Nine hundred fifty added on to the current one, which is four one eight one point five. So so the total would be fifty one hundred for FY twenty four. Um, we could add them up. They're the the acreages are here. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you had a total. Yeah. You don't have to add them up now at all. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's not like thousands of acres, but no, they're it's um, not, it's, it's they're. I think they're intense. Significant. Amount. They're intensively used. Yeah, and they're we're trying to make them more accessible, and we're trying to manage them for, you know, habitat and water quality, and public access. So I think the general fund. Then we've decided we we need to fund our part time. Recording secretary, we want to contract conservation easements, which is sort of a reporting, you know, monitoring thing. We want to maintain being a member of NHACC, and we don't really need $200 in supplies, so we can drop that down to $100. Um, part two of that, so that's the budget request. We'll talk about CIP in a second. The land use change tax from 50 to 100%. Um, I'm not sure, and, you know, because we're our town structure. I don't know if that's a Warren article or a town council decision. Do you, you probably haven't? It hasn't been discussed in a long time. Um, I can talk to Bart um, and ask him if he knows. Do we want to um, pursue that idea? We definitely, we definitely want to pursue it. I mean, that's the primary way at which the town. 
additional yeah. conservation fund, which it used to purchase and conserve additional property. So. Yeah, and I think we can we can talk about the list of um, projects that you know we're going to talk about some shortly. But you know we got to look at all avenues of funding because some of these are pretty um, high budget items we want to work on to improve the town. So. I think we should take a motion on the, the budget request for FY24. So we're at the numbers we talked about, 3,500 for part-time salary, 1,000 for contracted, 500 for dues, 100 for supplies. Uh, so that's um, 5,100, if I get my numbers right. Um, can we have a motion to <coughs> recommend that forward to? I make a motion to increase our general fund budget to 5,100 in order to bring that forward to the town manager for approval. For FY24? For yeah. FY24. Great. I have a second. Okay, discussion? I would say that they might want us to, I know that we discussed the different amounts going into the specific slots, but you might want to add that to the motion. To the motion? Okay. Uh, let's see. So increasing I think you can just say because I, it's yeah it's like you're starting kind of starting from somewhere you're just starting from scratch so you could just say how much we want for each category okay like part-time salary would be $3,500 uh, yeah uh, part-time salary 3500 um, increase the contracted um, budget to a thousand um, dues and subscriptions increased from 350 to uh, 700. 500. 500. Yeah. Um, and general supplies dropped by 100. So the total 100 for that. Yep. No postage. And no postage. <laughs> We've never gotten money for postage. That brings so I guess us we to 51. We can find money for that. Um, Can someone else do the math? I've done it twice. I get 5,200 as a total. 5,200. <laughs> <laughs> so it's increased the part-time salary by 165, increased the contracted amount by 700 to bring it to 1,000, mm -hmm. increased the uh, dues and subscriptions by, by 150, 150. and uh, I'm sorry, increase that, uh, and then decrease the general supplies by 100. That's what I didn't do. There we go. I didn't decrease the last. Yep. Right. My mistake. Minus a hundred. No, I so w the process would be I would write a memo as chair to Steve Fournier and copy Bart. That's what Bart suggested in terms of the budget process. So. We have a second. Uh, we had a second over here. The second the motion. Second the amended. motion as amended. And so all in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I'll write a memo. And um, do we want to make a motion to pursue requesting an increase of the land use change tax from 50% to 100%? I'll make a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. So that one we'll figure out what the process is and um, come back on that one. And I think uh, we'll make the case of why that would be really beneficial to the community as we move along in our budget discussions. Um, so another piece, oh, sorry, I didn't finish the, the budget. Uh, we finished the general fund, but not the other piece. Let's go look at the conservation fund. So. Basically, I started a new spreadsheet for the new fiscal year, starting July 1st. And if you look at the top um, for our conservation fund, we have still the 47, 64, 46 in the Shanda fund. And we have $129,846.64 in the conservation fund. So the total we have, it's really the total we have because the Shanda fund is specific to the Shanda um, park. Um, so you will notice if you look down on June 14th, we got $45,000 in land use change tax. So that's the first uh, funding we've gotten back into the account. So that is that is part of the total. So our total budget, um, we have 129,000 roughly. 
so the, I did this, um, so in parallel to that, I did this. Oh, no, yeah, not the arrow, but just to, to tack on to the land use yeah. track, just to publicly s like state it, the, the purpose, just within the last you know two years, we've been successful in basically using our general fund to contribute monetary you know, contributions to securing some sort of conservation easement on 220 acres of town, you know, property. Great, yeah. So the, Great it has a direct effect. Absolutely. So I think it's a surefire case to, to state that right. adding additional money to that has a direct ability for us to conserve more land. Very good. Good point. Yeah. Yes, Which absolutely. Which help offset right. the development of land. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're – um, Intended for, I think that's right. So, so that's a great point. So, if we look at this, um, I did a little memo about current fiscal year projects that we've already talked about doing and some possible expenditures, and then I was looking ahead at, at potential projects for FY24 because we have we have been so successful at this land conservation that Sam mentioned, um, but we are drawing down our funds. Even though we did get forty five thousand dollars, that's great. So we can continue to do projects, but. We don't have an endless amount of uh, current use land in Newmarket, so we're not going to continue to get tons of money. Um, we hope we'll continue to get some. So I think we have to start looking a little bit about, you know, what we're going to spend money on and what our priorities are. So I did put a little note in here about trying to reserve, you know, some amount. I just said seventy-five thousand dollars because we have contributed around that amount for a couple projects. So if we want to continue to do land conservation, we need to make sure we have some in reserve. So let's say we, you know, at 75,000 is just a, um, a number, but but that leaves, you know, 50 to $60,000 to do projects. Um, and we've got some big ones that we, we, we aren't going to probably have to fund the whole part of it, but we, we're going to have to do seed money or we're going to have to put, you know, maybe some, some funds in. So I just, I just wanted to go through the list just to brainstorm ideas of projects we're, we're working on for the community on these lands. So we have the invasive plant control, which we've already budgeted for, but we'll need to pay for that. We have um, a couple pieces of the Heron Point kiosk to finish up, which we budgeted for, um, but we haven't paid those out yet. So that'll come out of our total budget. Uh, we just talked about the Piscassic River Lysdale doing the footbridge, you know, buying some lumber. It's not a super amount of money, but Again, a project we want to do, the new road sign for Piscassic River Loisel. Um, we've talked about the conservation easement monitoring, which perhaps hopefully we can fund out of the general fund. Um, I thought we didn't have conservation uh, boundary signs, but I actually found they're, they're identical. So they're, it's a little confusing because they look the same. So one's for conservation easements uh, and one's for town land that we own. Um, and we have a box of each, so we have enough of these for now. If we ever decide we need more, I'd recommend we change up the design a little bit so they look different because it's a little, they almost look like they're the same to me. Like, it, you know, if you're just looking at them, you wouldn't know that one is a, uh, oh, wait, sorry. Sorry, that was a trick. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick. <laughs> 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 it is almost nine o'clock. There's a trick, <laughs> yeah, it's getting late. That's my bedtime. See, they still look a little, they look a little the same, though. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they still look a little bit the same, right? So, anyway. So we have those for now, so we don't need to buy those. So let's skip over that. Uh, it's getting late. All right. So we talked about, the next thing I had was this natural resource inventory and plan for the Fallsbrook region. It's Carolyn Drive, Fallsbrook, Zazik, Rizzo, those properties. Um, we're going to need to do some boundary surveys. There's a couple of those that we have no idea um, really where, I mean, we have some idea where the boundaries are, but they probably need to be surveyed. And if we want to get some, you know, somebody in, you know, like we did at Heron Point, we hired a, a consultant to do a plan. I think we'd want to do something for those properties out there. So, I mean, that, that could be, that itself could be, with boundary surveys and inventory, it could be thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. So, uh, that work isn't cheap. Uh, we talked to, with Barbara just now about prime wetlands mapping updates. Um, we're going to talk in very shortly about the riverfront, Moonlight Brook, Shanda Park um, projects. So we've got some big, big things on the horizon. Um, the other piece of this, which we don't really have to 
go into details tonight is I think we have to be careful about monies that we give to other outside groups. It's, they're nice ideas. Um, we've supported groups in the past, but if you look at the cumulative amount of money we give out, it starts to add up, and we're going to run out of money very quickly if we continue to, unfortunately, you know, give money to other groups. So it's just something to think about as we go forward this fiscal year um, to keep that in mind. Oh, the other, the other. So yeah, so we'll pick this this other um, issue up under a riverfront. Um, yeah. So any questions about the our current funding balances? Was I clear as mud there, Sue? Or you got it? <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. So so we talked about current budget. We talked about FY24. Um, Bart was not able to be here tonight, so but main thing he was going to talk about, I think, was Riverfront Advisory. Yeah. So we'll get to that in a second. So let's move on to committee board reports, uh, planning board. Jeff. Um, the only thing we did not discuss, the zoning that they, we were supposed to discuss for whatever reason wasn't on the agenda eventually and never came up. Um, the only thing that I have to report is we did talk about proposed changes, we briefly spoke about proposed changes to the accessory um, dwelling unit um, portion of the zoning. Um, and the only item that I believe that would be of a lot of interest at the moment to the Conservation Commission is they're, they're proposing a slight change to the Wetland Protection Overlay District um, uh, portion, section 32155. And it's simply just to say that um, any construction associated with it with an attached accessory dwelling unit is, is subject to the same regulations. So it's not trying to limp, it's not trying to take away any coverage, it's just to add mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. that's kind of a, uh, to, to mm -hmm. the things that are restricted. Yeah. So that's, that's the only thing mm -hmm. I have to okay. So that may, may come up, but we didn't really discuss it. Um, there's going to be a public hearing at some point on the proposed changes. Great. All right, thank that you. Should be all for me from the planning board. All right. Town Council. Yes, the last meeting we did um, read for the second time and then voted on the uh, resolution 2021-2022-37, which was the sustainable energy goals. Mm -hmm. uh, the change was made to take out the word uh, commit from the verbiage and replace it with aspire to. Um, prior to voting on that, there were 12 individual speakers from the public that came and spoke all in favor, all 12 in favor of passing the resolution. Uh, once every, all public comment was over and discussion amongst the town council was complete, uh, the co council did a vote 7-0 uh, to approve uh, to move forward with uh, the rest of the uh, resolution that was outlined prior. So it was uh, a hot topic to say the least. Uh, so. We uh, we took a long time to talk about it. it. Took a long time to vote it. As a matter of fact, I believe we had to extend our meeting until 9:30 before everything was said and done because of the length of time it took. As you know, all of us living in town and all of us being, you know, caring citizens of the town of Newmarket wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. And we're all, you know, doing what we thought best for the town, which is what we're there to do. And so I do believe that we did, as a as a council, make uh, the best decision for the town moving forward. Great. Um, that was about it as far as conservation commission stuff was concerned. I just have one question because there was one thing that came up at our planning board meeting that kind of concerned the town council that the commission might be interested in was the environment and energy committee. I understand there may have been discussion of adding members to 
to environment there was and energy? There was some discussion to change the current makeup to revert back to a previous makeup, uh, but nothing official was, was done at that meeting. It was because we also voted on a number of, and I don't have that number in front of me, but I want to say it was either four or five uh, applications to, uh, of which I believe all but one were for that, that particular commission. But yeah, the, there was a discussion about changing the verbiage back to uh, the makeup of, of what that, mm -hmm. what it consisted of, but, but nothing official was done as far as a vote of any kind or a right. or resolution or anything. And the top, my understanding is the top was the, because it used to, when it started, I was on the commission, it was when mm -hmm. we first members, it was required to have a member, or not required, but the the ability was to have someone appointed from the conservation commission okay. and someone appointed from the planning board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they were thinking of coming back to that, because the, mm -hmm. the environment and energy commission, my understanding, or committee, is, is looking for um, the planning board to move forward kind of more in charge, I guess, because mm -hmm. the planning board is charged with the, with the master plan, yeah. um, mm. kind of more involvement from, mm -hmm. from the planning board and conservation commission. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there was still some discussion on their part to be had in order to get um, everything in the row in, in line and heading in the, in the proper direction where they are now to where they want to be instead of um, maybe trying to find another way. We're operating through the channel that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the nicest way I can. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Most politically correct way. <laughs> <laughs> now outside in the parking lot after? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Colin. Yes. All right. Riverfront Advisory. We've got some stuff going on. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to keep this as, uh, as streamlined as possible. Kind of explain what what these are and then yeah, specifically what the, um, the ask of the commission is tonight. Um, so I'll start with the, the Shanda Park um, Living Shoreline Park Improvements one. Uh, if you remember, I want to say it was maybe like November, um, we had some guests here from the grant opportunity from uh, DES and UNH. They had uh, basically assembled a team of professionals to come and look at a few living shoreline spots. Two were in Newmarket. Um, one of them, uh, the site that they selected was Shanda Park. Um, so that was the first time I think that it was brought before this commission. Um, and then I believe I shared kind of the draft uh, outline that they had provided for what the living shoreline could potentially look like at Shanda Park as well as some general park improvements. And I want to say that was maybe um, this past March. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that stuff with me tonight. If anyone wants it or wants to talk to me about it, happy to provide it. Um, basically, in our discussions on the Riverfront Committee, we have continued to look for outside funding and grant opportunities. Um, it's just been a slow process. Uh, so we have kind of decided that there would be a lot of value in advancing actual CIP articles for consideration at the town level while we continue to search for these things to add another avenue to potentially get these things off the ground. So the Living Shoreline one um, and the Park Improvements Project is basically taking that rough 50% conceptual design that the town received through that grant funded program and then the fiscal year 23-24 ask would be for a $75,000 allocation to basically take that conceptual design and move it to a full publicly biddable design. Hire an outside consultant to come in, finish the design, work on the permitting process, work on the public education process, you know, basically pitch this idea to you know, more than the 20 or 30 people who have seen it, solicit feedback, that aspect of it. Um, the the four twenty five, uh, four hundred twenty five thousand dollar number under FY twenty four twenty five 
that's just an expectation of rough costs to implement all the park improvements. Um, it's really just provided for kind of economy of scale. Obviously, the CIP ask was only for the $75,000 right now, um, but at least to, to put a general you know, full scale project cost there so people know what it may be down the line. Um, so obviously the living shoreline is sort of the, the crown jewel of it, just being a, a relatively unique feature. There isn't a living shoreline in sort of a compact urban setting in New Hampshire like this. It is sort of a unique thing, potential you know new attraction to draw for the town. Um, other park improvements just include uh, a l little bit of maintenance, basically. Um, there's some issues to the, the walls around Moonlight Brook. There's um, the, the boat ramp, uh, instead of kind of graveling it each year and sort of watching the gravel eventually wash out into the library, you know, maybe get like precast concrete planks, something that's a little bit more expensive up front, but durable long term. So kind of minor modifications like that. Um, that's really the, the scope and scale of this project. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? So, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I don't, I think reading the strict classifications for the different categories, as much as I'd like to bump this one up, it doesn't really seem, it doesn't seem like it meets urgent. I, it doesn't even seem like it meets need. There's no, nothing functionally wrong with Shanda Park. I think it, the discussion at the committee level has largely been around, it provides potentially an opportunity to town. It's another feature. I mean, people specifically go to Wagon Hill to see the living shoreline. Now you mm -hmm. can go see the one in Newmarket and oh, hey, you're right downtown. Might as well you know, hang out and mm -hmm. spend some time in town. So the full scale construction of this hopeful that we can find some funding opportunities for that, but the, the upfront soft costs just to bring it from uh, an, uh, a focused idea to something that can be implemented, um, that mm -hmm. I think we've, we've been looking for funding and struggling to find it, hence mm -hmm. the, the push for a CIP. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of that one. The other one related to it um, is the Moonlight Brook uh, culvert. Um, there seems to be an overall kind of multifaceted issue with Moonlight Brook. There's been some minor water quality issues uh, as it outlets to the Lamprey. Um, the existing culverts that are under that land bridge between the portions of Shanda Park, um, uh, they're clogged with sediment. A lot of times they're kind of borderline non-functional. Um, they are probably undersized for today's, you know, stormwater and hydrologic design. Uh, so what is being been talked about at a high level amongst a few town departments is addressing this culvert. Um, everyone seems to kind of agree that something needs to be done. What exactly needs to be done? Probably not fully known yet. However, the first step in really doing anything is you really need to conduct an H and H study, uh, a hydrologic and hydraulic study, uh, really just a fancy term for you need to run some junior modeling and take some tests to figure out if you were going to replace this culvert, what do you need to replace it with, mm -hmm. and how big does it need to be? Um, really, before anything else can happen, you kind of need to do that because it sets the design criteria that will be the entirety of the project. So that one is labeled. Priority N, which is the step above D, um, does not risk it being a failure, but it is a, a needed project that I think is is firmly on multiple you know, department and groups mm -hmm. radars within the town. Um, the fifty thousand dollar ask may be on the higher end of what the H and H study would be, uh, but without a clearly defined scope, we kind of took the upper range of the cost estimates we've heard mm -hmm. and kind of put that as the ask for the next fiscal year. And no idea because you don't know what the, 
so they would show what the cost, total cost project might be? Offhand, it would really be a guess. Um, the, the best guess and the best comp that I can think of offhand would probably be the town's work with Lobo and Creek. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, costs have escalated quite a bit in the last few years, but um, that's really kind of the same general concept of, you know, upsizing a, a culvert with something a little bit more substantial mm -hmm. and, you know, doing that within a fairly major wetland and potentially with multiple outside, you know, permitting mm -hmm. partners and funding agencies. Right, it's not a road, but it is a complicated uh, wetland it there. Is, it is. <laughs> um, what was the, do we know, what, the, what was the Lebanon Creek cost, do we know? I don't know offhand, I'm not sure. Any idea? I can't remember. Yeah. I don't know what it was either. It wasn't that much. But that was, a, again, a, a mm -hmm. roadway, a larger yeah. span, probably. Yeah. Is there, there I don't think there was a lot of study costs up front. Maybe there were, but I don't remember. I think we gave, we contributed 25 on that. I'm just wondering if there's a reason not to parallel, like you've got a project, I know it's hard to estimate, but you've got a project yeah. cost for the Tanda Park. It so the thought project. behind yeah. this is that despite them both being in Shanda Park, um, the major discussion at the Riverfront Committee level has actually been trying to kind of decouple these two components mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. the culvert is likely going to take potentially more time mm -hmm. than the other efforts would um, to the tune of 12 to 24 months, depending mm -hmm. on pace. Mm -hmm. um, so we've tried to kind of just separate them a little bit so that the culvert isn't dragging down the other mm -hmm. parts of it. Mm -hmm unless that seems to be the holistic approach that the town wants to take. Mm -hmm. um, so we debated at our meeting on Monday uh, this article and that exact question, and we ended up removing basically the placeholder costs we had in here to okay. construct the project because the, the discussion was basically that we weren't sure what the design would need to be mm -hmm. because we haven't done the H&H &H study and because we didn't know what we were going to be mm -hmm. putting in that yeah. the H&H &H study would refine the scope of the design, which would refine the scope of the capital project mm -hmm. task. And also we would have at least another year to pursue outside mm -hmm. uh, options to see if we can find anyone to contribute financially to it. Yeah. This Would this include um, the the two embankments on the on the other side on the on the you know the river side of the bridge there the footbridge the walkway depending what it is kind of yes because <laughs> those are, I mean they're pretty big stones there and they're all falling in and everything yeah so between one of these that would put it up I, I would kind of the park improvements one you wouldn't have to wait to do the culvert to you know, address that, mm -hmm. especially since it's been sort of a known issue for a couple of years. Um, you would obviously want to be careful that you don't make too many improvements and then have to immediately yeah, <laughs> disrupt right. them yeah. with this. Right. So there would have uh -huh. to be kind of some uh, understanding or at least awareness that there may be a, a parallel project occurring soon. So, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. so you didn't disrupt something you just completed. Yeah. I just wasn't sure since it really essentially was part of the channel that leads out yes. if that was included in this in the culvert project. I think uh, back to, to pointing out the priority, I think if if we as the Conservation Commission are, you know, putting this forward to the CIB or in partnership with the Riverfront, however, however it works out, um, I still think that could be considered a need and not just a desire because it's eroding. The shorefront, the shoreline is eroding, and so from a conservation perspective, um, we're not we're not being good stewards of the river. We're not being good stewards of that that shoreline. We're not being good stewards of that park. So, I would advocate bumping that up to a need. Partly because I think it just goes so parallel to the moonlight the moonlight brook restoration. Um, I see that all part is, I mean, I understand totally why they're being separated, so that makes sense to me. But in terms of ecologically and the system, 
I think they're both a need. Is it, is it not a DPW project because there's no like public welfare risk or something, or or because it's there, it's a town-owned drainage structure, essentially, right? Uh, so I don't I don't want to speak for other departments, obviously, nor am I qualified to to do so. But I think it's something that is tangentially on a few people's radars, including Public Works with the culvert, including, um, you know, potentially the stormwater aspects of it and some of the water quality stuff. So I, I think it has been kind of acknowledged there's an issue here. Um, I don't know if really anyone has put forth anything to do something with it yet. So the hope is that, you know, this may be here, but I it is possible that other people have put forth some article to start looking <coughs> at this too, and hopefully they can be combined and mm. something can be allocated mm -hmm. for it. And that, that's kind of what happened with Lubbock and Creek, right? Because the, the whole replacement came from the Conservation Commission and the Nature Conservancy, but then I believe DPW did the construction, mm -hmm. if I'm not yeah. mistaken, or, or so that was kind of like the town itself. Right. It's a partnership, it's a partnership, collaboration, yeah. 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 Yeah, so pre present it, and then hopefully yeah. people say, oh, yeah, we've been talking about that too, and then suddenly, you know, three or four people have an interest in this, and it becomes a reality. Yeah, so I, I wasn't trying to pick on DPW. <laughs> I was yeah. just curious yeah. if that discussion had been already been had, and that's all. So the general park improvements under that grant were presented at least just kind of, again, conceptually, like a one-hour kind of open discussion with, Water, wastewater, public works, parks and rec. Um, so the actual, you know, town officials have have seen it and at least been able to interface with it for a short period of time. You know, part of the the park improvements one would be to have a little bit more pointed public outreach time to refine mm -hmm. that scope and and solicit mm -hmm. a little bit more mm -hmm. input. So specifically, what I guess the ask is is kind of twofold. Um, the initial concept is just uh, Shanda Park is a conservation property. So it's just conceptually, does the commission buy into the goals of this article? That is sort of ask number one. And then ask number two is, I believe despite even being a riverfront you know, advisory committee, we could technically advance these. Um, our discussion has always been that there may be more value in them being advanced with Conservation Commission as basically the mm -hmm. person submitting them since we're an actual seated commission with mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. voted appointed members mm -hmm. and the stewards of the property itself. Mm -hmm. So that might carry more weight. So those are kind of the, the mm -hmm. two asks. Uh, yeah, comments from the other <laughs> members. It's reasonable. That makes yeah. sense because it's almost like you're you're going to the people that manage the property and say, "This is what we think we should do." So yeah. more or less, right? Yeah, pretty much. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, just a kind of couple. I um, I do think again, since we have statutory responsibility for you know natural resources in our community, water, wetlands, I would raised a priority, although I haven't read the, I haven't really, I don't know the specs on, there. Uh, there's definitions to the priorities and what there's, what there. Yeah. What's that? Okay, but if we're the Conservation Commission, and these to me are some of the two highest priority projects we could advance in terms of this level yeah. of um, project, besides the Ash Swamp Culvert, which we've talked about, but really haven't advanced that, that these would be uh, needs, like these, we need to do these. Um, yeah, it's been many years that they've been failing. Um, or, I, I mean, really a long time ago, we had Underwood engineers out here, and we walked and worked, because the bank was failing then on the side of yeah. the Moonlight Brook. Um, yeah. So it's it's been like a mm -hmm. long time. We didn't have any way to get money. We didn't, yeah. you know, for better or worse, we didn't. I don't think we really yeah. talked about the CIP um, to get funds, so yeah. I think it's... I think it's be, it's also becoming more of a destination. I think mm -hmm. for folks, there's more people walking around downtown. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's important. The other thing I think would be nice, even if we, as the conservation commission, um, are the ones submitting it, 
somewhere in here, whether it's we had to submit it by and it, it, it's a collaboration with the Riverfront Advisory, because you guys put it, I mean, you, that, your group put it together. So I would like that language in here somewhere that says this is in collaboration with the Riverfront Advisory Committee. Yeah, we can put that in. And um, the expectation, <laughs> we don't get a lot of room to write about mm. what these are. Mm -hmm. um, but they do all get discussed eventually come come early September. So I yeah. would plan to, to show up. Um, yeah, if there's a way that we could squeeze in a sentence, even if we put it, there's a one blank line at the bottom, an asterisk under submitted by, and say this is in collaboration with the yeah. Riverfront Advisory Committee. I would yeah, recommend I those two. Make those changes. Um, yeah, that's a. How do you feel about increasing the changing from a desire to need under the priority for Chanda Park? Can we do that if we're the ones submitting? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's open to the, the commission's interpretation. I, uh, yeah, if we're, if we're fixing components of, of the park itself and rehabbing, you know, a land that is maintained and conserved by this commission and by the town, so. Yeah. And safe. And safe, yeah, I think it is, a, there's a becoming a safety issue with everything starting to fall in the river, so. Um, okay, so we probably should, if there's more discussion, or we take a motion to endorse these two uh, CIP, uh, what do you call them, applications? What are they called? CIP project proposals, project requests. Mm -hmm. There we go. Thank you, sir. Um, take a motion for both of them at the same time, or with those changes to the documents that Sam's provided? What would you like to do? I can make a motion. I can make a motion to share, right? I will make a motion that we uh, endorse the two CIP project request forms related to Shanda Park and Moonlight Brook that we um, have been presented by the River Advisory Committee via Sam and that we change the priority of the Shanda Park from D to N for need and that we include a comment line to say this is in collaboration with the Riverfront Advisory Committee. I second. Second. Milas, any discussion? Um, I, I am the Conservation Commission rep to the Riverfront Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so obviously, in both shoes, does anyone see a problem with me? I don't think so. <laughs> voting Your goal is to vote well. in both places, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Putting it out there yeah. for it's not, you're not getting a private benefit. This is your, you know, you're serving as the rep, so it's no problem. Uh, okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Awesome. I think everybody would. Great. Thank you, Sam. Great work. Yeah, no, I appreciate everyone's kind of time considering. Um, I will make these amendments and get them in uh, within kind of the next week Great. since they are basically due before the next. Uh, meeting, next Conservation Commission meeting would be. Yeah, awesome. Um, one other piece related to that, I don't know, I assume Bart's chatted with the committee um, about this idea of a charrette. I don't remember if it was, you maybe talked about it at the last meeting, I wasn't here. Uh, in June of 2023, perhaps, somewhere in that, and having a New Hampshire plan or one of the groups do the charrette with the advisory committee? Yeah, so Bart did discuss that at our meeting on Monday as well. Um, that also came out at our July meeting. Um, the grant discussion has been, yeah, for Plan New Hampshire, and it would be um, seeking a, a grant for the town to hold the, an open charrette to discuss conceptual usage um, of the riverfront as well as a few other areas. Yeah, so one of the things, Bart, I chatted to him today because he couldn't make it tonight, but um, one of the things that he's meeting, I think, with the group in September to plan that they need a yeah. lot of lead time to plan these charrettes. So they want to know, you know, what questions or issues do they want, do we all want discussed at this charrette? So um, what might people be interested in? Like what, what do they, how do they use the riverfront? Um, do people want a bridge to Heron Point? Um, you know, so we need to come up with those, at least some of the questions, so then Bart can provide those to the plan New Hampshire. So if you all can, you know, put your ideas together, if you've got one or two or three questions, not just that you might have, but you think other people might want mm -hmm. to ask or that we want, feedback from the community that participates, we want answers from those particular questions. Um, would it be worth coming up with um, a couple of sentences for that for like the Facebook group? And we could I think put so. it to the public? Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe um, we could check with Bart and maybe he could write what blurb we want to put on okay. Facebook. That would be a good idea. I can talk with him about that. Um, I do want to say one more thing. I was kind of getting late. But uh, no, <laughs> the totally. um, Go for it. it. Going back to the Shanda Park and the Living Shoreline thing, just if anyone is kind of listening on that, one of um, and the primary goals and, okay. and edicts we gave literally from day one to that design group is um, – Shanda Park is obviously a small, compact feature, and the, the number one directive we gave them is we, we can't lose usable park space mm. on that. So uh, when people hear Living Shoreline and then hear things like Wagon Hill, they think of yeah. space and area required for that. Mm. But um, the, the whole concept and layout that has been designed is to maintain the usable area of Shanda Park and anything that gives given up for... Um, the shoreline area to try to get back somewhere else mm. and we think we can do that potentially with just um actually extending the frontage of the park out a little bit mm. because it's already buckled in further than it mm. has to be from the um the curvature of the river so great it's really good it's a great project um great well thank you again sam for all that work um, I think we just, that's it, we'll move on events. So our next meeting is September 8th. We're gonna have Emma Tutin from UNH Extension help us with conservation easement monitoring. I thought we should um, get a little refresher course uh, training on easement monitoring. We can revisit the easements we have, talk again about um, possibly farming those out to SELT if that's what we wanna move forward with. And then October 15th is our conservation connections. We, um, for November, we're gonna have the Nature Conservancy come and talk to us about a potential oyster farming uh, pilot in the Lamprey River community oyster program. Cool. So that's, that's exciting. Um, so people can tune in on that. Anything else before we adjourn? Let's see where we, well, the only thing I see in here regarding the funding that we, we gave to, for the creek, uh, leveling creek was oh. $10,000. For the Nature Conservancy, the email said first and final invoice <laughs> to the town of Newmarket. So <laughs> we may have given more money uh, later because mm -hmm. I know the bridge was finished a little bit mm -hmm. after I left the commission. Yeah, so good. But but so just but it just speaks again to the amount of money that we're contributing to these incredible projects, and so we need to maintain that to be able to keep doing these good projects. So very good. All right. So we'll see you um, sometime, if not before that. We'll see you in September. Vote to adjourn. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good stuff.